It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Good morning, Speaker. The walls are closing in on this government. They're cleaning house and have brought in a high-level fixer to try to provide crisis response. They've lost numerous ministers and senior political staff to the Greenbelt scandal and are desperately trying to change the channel. Speaker, the people of this province are concerned about being able to pay their bills or find a family doctor. So to the Premier, when will this government clean up this mess of their own creation so they can start to help people who are struggling right now? And to reply, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, we've uh, been doing that uh, uh, really since the beginning, uh, right? Since 2018, we've brought in a number of measures to improve housing supply across the province of Ontario. At the same time, we uh, set out uh, almost immediately to eliminate uh, uh, red tape, useless red tape across the province of Ontario. We brought in uh, additional measures uh, to uh, help uh, support our small, medium and large uh, uh, job creators, and the impact of that has been significant. Speaker, look, we've seen the creation of 700,000 jobs because of the policies that we have brought in place. That is 700,000 people who have the dignity of a job today that didn't when we took office. We're seeing $28 billion worth of investments in our uh, uh, in, our, uh, in our economy, we have over 300,000 jobs that need to be filled. Uh, speaker, our housing starts are at their highest level in over 30 years. Our purpose-built re rental starts are at their uh, highest level Response. in over 30 years. We're on the right track, uh, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to continue that progress for the people of the province of Ontario. The supplementary question. Speaker, the clock is ticking on just how long this government can keep their backroom deals from the public. The RCMP has now appointed a special prosecutor who is investigating this government, a criminal investigation. Environmental organizations are suing to get access to government documents that the government is desperate to hide. So to the Premier, is he concerned about what the Greenbelt documents will reveal to the RCMP special prosecutor? Mr. Mitchell Affairs and Housing. Speaker, as we've said the entire time, we will uh, assist uh, uh, the RCMP uh, in, uh, in, its, in its work, but that's not going to stop us from uh, doing what we set out to do, and that is ensuring that we build more homes across the province of Ontario. Look, we're, in, we're encouraging and inviting over a million people to come to Ontario each and every year. That is a million people who will help build our economy, who will help build our province to make it a bigger, better, stronger Ontario, but at the same time, Mr. Speaker, we have to worry and help those who want the dream of home ownership. I was just out uh, on, on Sunday and I, I came across a young Ontarian who has done everything right, Christina, and she said the same thing. You know, I've done everything right. I had a 20 percent down payment, but the increase in interest rates is hurting me, it's hurting my family, and you have to do something about it. We're doing something about it, Mr. Speaker. We're reducing taxes for all Spons. the people of the province of Ontario. The Premier has shown leadership with uh, encouraging the Bank of Canada to stop its, uh, its rapid uh, rate uh, increase, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to continue to do everything we can to support Ontarians and the economy. You. Final supplement. Thank you, Speaker. This Premier has said they have, quote, the most ethical, most transparent, and most accountable caucus he's ever seen. Well, that was before a damning Auditor General's report that highlighted a pattern of preferential treatment and deleted emails. That was before a minister broke ethics laws twice. And let's not forget the fact that this government is currently under a RCMP criminal investigation for its dirty deals. So, Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Would the Premier like to take the opportunity to correct the record? Members will take their seats. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, Speaker, look, we have been focused since day one on improving the economy of the province of Ontario. It is no secret that we inherited a government and a province that was really hurting. We were the most indebted uh, jurisdiction. We were the highest tax jurisdiction. We were the most overregulated jurisdiction in uh, in Canada, Mr. Speaker. We had out of control hydro rates. People had to choose between heating or eating. Companies were fleeing Ontario. Investment was fleeing Ontario, and Order. all of that changed in 2018 when Ontarians elected a strong progressive conservative majority. And what have we done? We put in the environment to create 700,000 jobs. We've reduced Order. taxes, eliminated. Uh, useless uh, red tape. We've cut the cost of doing business in Ontario by $8 billion, while at the same time, Mr. Speaker, cutting taxes for the lowest income Ontarians and building the largest investment in transit Response. transportation in the history 
of the province, Mr. Speaker. We're getting the job done for the people of the province of Ontario, and we will not stop. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, from red tape to brown envelopes. That's where we are today. <laughs> Speaker, this question is for the Premier. The NDP has found that the Premier has issued as many fast-tracked minister zoning orders benefiting just the guests alone at the Ford family wedding reception as the previous government issued during its entire 15 years in power, 18 MZOs. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Why is the Premier's government handing out MZOs to his friends like party favours? Minister of Affairs and Housing. Speaker, what are we doing? We're handing MZOs to people who want to build long-term care homes. We're handing out MZOs for people who want to build social housing across the province of Ontario. We're handing out MZOs so that we can build more schools. We're doing MZOs so that we can get transit and transportation built faster. We're doing MZOs so that we can build more hospitals all across the province of Ontario. And we're giving out MZOs so that we can meet our goal of building 1.5 million homes across the province of Ontario. And I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, as the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, I will not stop on that mission to ensure Order. that we can meet our goal of building 1.5 million homes, because they may want the next generation to live Order. in their parents' basement. We want the next generation to have all of the same advantages that we have had, the dream of home ownership to become Response. a reality, and we will not let obstacles stand in the way. In her own question, she highlights just how bad the previous Liberal and NDP coalition government was. They got nothing done for the people of Ontario, and we're doing just the opposite. We're getting it done. Supplementary question. Speaker, the Speaker, uh, the Premier's friend, uh, Shakir Ribatula, attended the Premier's daughter's wedding reception last year. He owns Flato Developments, which has received more MZOs than any other developer, including one in Markham, where new homes were supposed to be built. It instantly increased the value of the land by 20 times, Speaker, generating hundreds of millions in speculative profits for Mr. Ribatula, all without building a single home. Then Flato sold part of the land. So to the Premier, did Mr. Ramatula get these MZOs because he is the Premier's friend? Minister, Minister Affairs and Health. Actually, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Ramatula got the MZO because both the city of Markham and the town of Stouffville requested that an MZO be, be created so that we can get more homes in the ground faster. Now, the development the member talks about will include housing for seniors. It'll include purpose-built rental housing, Mr. Speaker. It is part of an area that had been delayed for many, many years, Speaker. And both the City of Markham, Mayor Scarpitti and Mayor Lovett asked for a ministerial zoning order so that we can make progress on getting shovels in the ground faster. Now, the member opposite might be opposed to that, but in my community, we are very much in support of that. You know why, Mr. Speaker? Because more purpose-built rentals, more seniors-focused housing means more homes available for the next generation who want to get out of their parents' basement and into the community, Mr. Speaker. That's why we're doing MZOs. The member is opposed to that. I am not. Response. This Premier is not. This Conservative caucus is not, Mr. Speaker. We'll get the job done for the people of the province of Ontario. We're in a crisis, and we'll ensure that we meet the goal of 1.5 million homes. The final supplementary. Speaker, if, if only it ended there. After Mr. Ramatula, the Cordellucci family has been the second biggest recipient of MZOs. Mario Cardellucci sat next to the Premier at the infamous wedding reception. Several other members of the Cordellucci family were seated nearby. You know who else was at the Premier's table, Speaker? Developer Carmen Negro, whose company received a favourable MZO as well. To the Premier, did the government give preferential treatment to the Cordellucci family, Mr. Negro, or any of the other guests at the reception? Mr. And Mr. Affairs and Housing. Our MZOs, we ensure that we have support of the community when we do those MZOs, Mr. Speaker. Now, now, it is true. There have been instances when, I, when we have done MZOs that were not uh, supported by the community, ostensibly to build long-term care homes. Now, I've said this in this House, whether it was in Port Hope or in Pickering, when those communities voted against building new long-term care homes, I requested an MZO despite the fact that, the, that the, the local council was not in support of that, Mr. Speaker. But when we're talking about building homes, what you see is that municipalities 
towns are asking us to bring these MZOs. There is a favourable motion from their council, Mr. Speaker, because they want the exact same thing. They want to build homes for people. This Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade and this Premier are bringing billions of dollars of investments to communities across the province, and they need housing. When long-term care homes are built with four hours of care, that means more nurses, more PSWs. They need to have a place to live. Now, we're building that in different communities, and we're going to continue to get the job done. The next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Through you to the Premier. Last year, I asked the former Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing about a minister's zoning order issued in Oromodonti for a medical innovation park. The innovation park was never built. Instead, the owners attempted to sell the land unchanged for about 10 times what they paid for it before getting the MZO. The former minister said he would revoke the order, but he never did. Speaker, why is the Premier allowing this speculator to keep the profits from an MZO for a medical innovation park that was never built? The Minister of Affairs and Housing. Thank you, uh, thank you, Speaker. And that is part of the review. If something has been uh, issued that has not progressed in the fashion that we want it to have progressed, if it does not meet the goal of building 1.5 million homes, if it does not meet the goal of bringing job and economic activity to a community, then we will revoke that MZO, Mr. Speaker. That is part of the review. But let there be no doubt that when it comes to building homes for the people of the province of Ontario, we will continue to be aggressive. When it comes to meeting uh, uh, opportunities for job creation in communities, we will continue to be aggressive, uh, Mr. Speaker. We have so much to untangle left behind by the previous Liberal and NDP administration, but we're on the right path. 700,000 jobs, 700,000 people who have the dignity of a job that had lost the dream of that under the Liberals and NDP that were moving to every other part of this country because they didn't see Ontario as a place to live, work, invest, or raise a family. Response. That all changed in 2018, Mr. Speaker. We're on the right path, and we will not be distracted by the opposition. The supplementary question. Speaker, if you're a friend of the Premier, this government will hand out MZOs like candy. But if you're, a building, uh, if you're building affordable housing, this government makes you wait. Years ago, the City of Toronto requested MZOs to fast-track several affordable housing projects. Unlike many of the MZOs, this government gives out to its friends there was public consultation, a staff recommendation, and council approval. The government approved all the city's MZO requests except one, an affordable housing building at 175 Cummer in Willowdale. It remains in limbo to this day. Speaker, will the Premier tell us, did the government single out that affordable housing project for delay because it was opposed by the PC donor who is building luxury homes across the street? Excellent yes or no? Question. Members, please take their seats. Mr. Affairs and Housing. So, let me get this straight, colleagues. Let me just get this straight, because they are flipping and flopping all over the place. The NDP, right? So now he wants me to do an MZO, but he's against the hundreds of social housing that Toronto did get and is building and has completed because of an MZO in their own communities, in some of their own backyards. Order. What is it? Do you want an MZO or do you not want an MZO? This is the dilemma of the NDP. One day they want a carbon tax, the next day they don't. But hallelujah, last Thursday they voted with us to repeal the carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. So we're making progress. We're making progress, but let me tell the member opposite, I am encouraged by the fact that despite what Response. his leader has said, he is in favour of doing MZOs to build the communities faster. The division within that party continues, but he can count on us to get the job done. Order. The next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Premier, the impact of the carbon tax is truly devastating for all Ontarians. Canada's parliamentary budget officer has warned that the federal carbon tax will cost the average Ontario family far more than they would ever get back in rebate checks. The average Ontario household will have a net loss of $478 in 2023 thanks to the carbon tax, even after the rebates. But things are going to get much worse. 
The original carbon tax is going to keep going up until 2030, and the carbon tax on gasoline will also keep rising. According to the same Parliamentary Budget Office report, the carbon tax hikes will turn a $478 a household loss this year into a staggering $1,820 loss in 2030. Speaker, can the Premier please share his views on what impact the carbon tax is having on the people of Ontario? Thank you. To respond, the Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I want to thank the member from Brantford Brant. You're doing a great job out there. I hear it when the calls are coming in. The carbon tax, Mr. Speaker, and I've said it from day one, is the worst tax you could ever put on the backs of people, on the backs of businesses, making us uncompetitive around the world. It is a tax imposed by a bunch of elites and extremists on one side of the aisle that hurts working families across our province. When I heard what the parliamentary budget officer said, I couldn't believe it. Ontario families will be out nearly $2,000 a year once 2030 comes around because of the carbon tax. It's unbelievable. Two thousand dollars and that by the way that's after tax Water. dollars mr speaker this is wrong it's not Lots. fair to the people the carbon tax is making life more expensive every single day in every part of our province thank you thank you the supplementary question thank you speaker and thank you premier we can see the negative impact that the carbon tax is having on everyday essential items that the people of Ontario need. Whether it's the clothes we wear, or the food we buy, or the fuel that we put into our cars, every single thing that we buy has an inflation built into it now because of this carbon tax. We need to take action to scrap the carbon tax in order to give our hard-working families much-needed relief. Unfortunately. The opposition Liberals and the NDP continue to vote against the measures that we've taken, measures that would make life more affordable for the people of Ontario. Speaker, can the Premier please share his views on the opposition once again saying no, no to making life more affordable for the people of Ontario? Thank you. Premier. Sure, I find it very ironic hearing the Liberals and NDP talking about affordability and cost of living issues when they vote against every single bill we put forward to take the burden off of people. These issues are made even worse by the carbon tax, the tax they have both championed for years after years after years. Now it appears that the NDP and the Liberals are trying to confuse Ontarians about their record when it comes to their support of the carbon tax. The Liberals now seem to be uncertain about where they stand. We saw just last week the Liberal member from Orleans voted in favour of our motion to remove the carbon tax. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate it. While the rest the carbon tax on the groceries, while the rest of the six members that they have Response. voted for it. And even the NDP members voted this one one time against the carbon tax. And they have the carbon tax king sitting over in the corner that has voted for the highest carbon tax in the entire world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kiwetanon. Good morning, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Um, I introduced a motion last week to recognize Indigenous determinants of health across ministries. Speaker, uh, the health care system in Ontario does not work for Indigenous people. Not doing enough to improve that makes this government part of the problem. The chiefs of the Sulakaut uh, area declared a public health emergency and social crisis related to the mental health and addictions. Will this government support the motion to improve Indigenous health outcomes in Ontario? Yes or no? Members, will please take their seats. Minister of Northern Development and Indigenous Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I want to acknowledge the unfortunate passing, the suicide of a young lady, Elena Cecilia Nancy Birdie, who committed suicide in Sioux Lookout. She's from, on Sunday evening, she's from Kingfisher Lake. 
uh, the member from Kiwetnung's home, and has family in Sachigo Lake. Her grandfather, Titus Tate, is a, is a friend of mine. We grieve with the community, uh, with the communities, and uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that first and foremost. Now, Mr. Speaker, with respect to the private member's bill, there's a good way of working through the legislature with those with respect to those private members bills and when you want to put a report on the table for us to consider and debate maybe put it out a little bit sooner than one day before the motion is tabled thank you mr speaker the supplementary question speaker uh, the government says it recognizes the health outcomes for indigenous people are lower than other ontarians I know that uh, Elena Beardy, age 11, of uh, King Lake First Nation, took her life this weekend. Elena should have had all the opportunities other kids in Ontario have to grow up. Speaker, but uh, she did not. Whatever this government thinks they're doing isn't happening fast enough. Will this government support my motion to recognize colonialism? and being a business as a determinant of health, yes or no? Members, please take their seats. And to reply, the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, my heart goes out as well uh, to the young lady, to the family, and to the entire community with respect to the grave loss that occurred on Sunday. Mr. Speaker, we know that there are gaps in care that are faced by Indigenous communities and those in the North, and we have been and will continue making investments to ensure that these gaps are filled. In August, I was in Sioux Lookout just recently to announce the opening of new safe, sobering withdrawal management and supportive treatment beds with an investment of over $4 million. In addition to that, annually, we're investing $40 million in Indigenous care organizations and are building productive working relationships to ensure that Indigenous communities throughout the province have access to culturally appropriate mental health and addiction supports. Response. We know that more needs to be done, Mr. Speaker, and we are working to ensure, through the different investments that are being made, that the care that is culturally safe and appropriate is being provided to all communities in the province. Very much. The next question, the member for Peterborough Court. Speaker, I have a question for the Minister of Energy. Last Thursday, the Prime Minister finally recognized what the Premier has been saying for years. Yeah, finally. The carbon tax is raising the price on everything. Yes. After years of pushing energy costs higher, the Prime Minister has finally announced he was pausing the carbon tax, <laughs> but only on home heating oil, mm. and only for three years. Over the weekend, I heard from many of my constituents who heat with natural gas or propane, exactly. who are concerned that the federal government is leaving them out in the cold this winter. That's true. And no one should be choosing between heating and eating. Yep. Speaker, to the minister, is it true that the federal government is going to continue to raise carbon tax on my constituents who heat with natural gas or propane? Good question. And to respond, <laughs> Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, unfortunately, uh, the member from Peterborough is correct yet again. The Prime Minister clearly stated that this pause that was announced last week to the federal carbon tax is only going to apply to those who use home heating oil, which is only 2.5% of the people in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. The vast majority of the people in, in Ontario, more than 70% of them, Mr. Speaker, are using lower emission forms of energy like propane and natural gas and what they're going to see mr speaker is the carbon tax continue to go up and up and up that means more money out of their pockets mr speaker at a time when affordability is tough for people across ontario as the premier just mentioned the carbon tax is driving up the price of gasoline it's driving driving up the price of housing it's driving up grocery prices mr speaker this change from the federal liberal government the government of Canada, Mr. Speaker, is too little and too late. They need to start acting like the government of Canada, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that. Yeah. I truly do not understand why the federal government is intentionally leaving out Ontarians from relief on their federal taxes 
on their energy bills. That's right. Families and businesses in my riding have told me they're already feeling the impact of the carbon tax on their bills every single month. They can't afford higher taxes that the opposition Liberals and NDP want to impose. It's Speaker, true. It's true. does the minister know how much higher the good people of Peterborough Kawartha can expect their energy bills to go if the federal government continues to deny any relief to Ontario? Good question. Minister of Energy. Speaker, I'm not surprised that families and the members riding are already feeling the impact of the federal carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. Just this year alone, the federal tax is adding almost $300 to households there on their natural gas uh, heating alone, Mr. Speaker. That's more than $24 a month. The same goes for households that heat with propane, which are already paying $250 more in taxes this year. But it's not going to stop there, Mr. Speaker. By 2030, the federal government, with uh, the opposition party's support here at Queen's Park, that includes the current Liberal caucus and the NDP opposition, Mr. Speaker, want to nearly triple the carbon tax across Canada, Mr. Speaker. The feds aren't done yet, is the bottom line. Ontarians can't afford higher taxes, especially Order. at this time, Mr. Speaker. And these parties, the Order. Liberals, Response. the NDP, and the federal Liberals, couldn't be more out of touch. While we're reducing the cost of living, Mr. Speaker, they're continuing to make it more and more expensive for the people of Canada. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa, West Nepean. Thank you, Speaker. Our kids deserve support, but this government is critically underfunding schools across the province. Despite years of high inflation and the need for greater supports, education spending is down $1,200 per student, thanks to this government. The minister's attempts at creative accounting and messaging can't hide the impact, and it's our kids who are paying the price. Will the government commit to restoring per-student funding to where it was before their cuts? To reply, the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, kids pay the price when the NDP sit on the sidelines and not urge their union friends to get a deal with this government that keeps kids in class. That's when they pay the price. When you lack the courage to urge your union federation friends to get off their hands and sign a deal Order. that keeps kids in class. They pay Order. the price when you vote against a budget that increased funding to a historic high of $700 million more million this year just compared to last year. They pay the price when the NDP and the Liberals vote against 2,000 additional frontline educators supporting our kids with an emphasis on literacy and math. Mr. Speaker, you pay the price. These kids pay the price when they oppose our efforts to go back to basics in the classroom, which every Every parent in this province wants. We are going to stand up for common sense in our education system, for a more quality, focused system that lifts Response. standards on reading, writing, and math. We are going to stand up for students and demand better for the people of this province. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. There is one person in this chamber who can do more than anything else to protect our kids' school year, and it is that minister who is refusing to set negotiating dates with unions. Teachers and education workers are united in fighting for better conditions for our schools. They're looking for more supports for our students with special needs, mental health resources, a strategy to address violence in schools, and for an acknowledgement of the staffing crisis that we are facing. Both the Elementary Teachers Federation and the Catholic Teachers have won strong strike mandates. Will the minister finally come to the table now and bargain in good faith to protect our kids' school year? The Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, there the member goes again, standing with the unions on a strike vote instead of urging them to sign a deal that keeps kids in school. They have a duty to stand up for their constituents. And while it's clear that this is an issue that brings great sense of defensive energy from Order. the NDP, because I know they're now finally being acknowledged for standing with unions and of standing with parents and demand these kids stay in school. We're going to go back to basics. We're going to increase funding and increase staffing, and we're going to demand better for Ontario students in this province. The next question, the member for Beaches, East York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning, everyone. My question is for the Premier. The government is scared. They're scared of what the RCMP criminal investigation might uncover about the $8.3 billion Greenbelt deal. They're scared of what might be revealed in the 7,000-page FOI to be released later today. 
They're scared that they just can't maintain their promise to get 1.5 million homes built by 2031. They're scared that they just don't have it in them to get it done. That's why they have to water down the deal. Mr. Speaker, a bed is not a home, and it should not count as such. We desperately need more long-term care units, but classifying them as housing is completely malarkey. As experts and analysts did not include these much-needed beds in Ontario housing needs. The Premier himself has said that the target numbers actually should be 1.8 million homes, given recent po population growth. So why water it down now? My question. Thank you. <laughs> to reply, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, you know the last time I was afraid was in 2018 when we had to look at the books of the province of Ontario, Order. Mr. Speaker. Now, let's listen to what the member opposite just said. And to be, to be clear, the leader of the opposition today doubled down on this. They have both said that long-term care homes are not homes. Well, let me tell you something. When I was the minister of long-term care and this minister of long-term care are doubling Order. down because you know what? It is a home. It is a home for every single— Stop the clock. Let's start again. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing has the floor. Let me just say this. Let me say this. I dare the members opposite to go into a long-term care home and tell a senior that the home that they're living in is not a home, Mr. Speaker. There are 30,000 seniors who will have a brand new home because of the work that this province Order. and this premier and that Spons. minister of long-term care are doing, Mr. Speaker. That is 30,000 seniors who will have a home that never could have imagined it under the Liberals and the NDP. Order. A supplementary question. Enough of, enough of the distractions, Mr. Speaker. The bottom line is this government is failing on its promise to build homes. The province is relying on accounting trickery, and it's not even Halloween yet, Mr. Speaker. Rather than actually moving forward with getting homes built, they find loopholes to attempt to reach their goal, like counting long-term care beds. Can we just, for once, Order. stop? with the distractions, with the debauchery, with the dynamics, and focus on the task at hand to actually build housing in a housing crisis, no less. There are simple solutions. Be bold. Legalize building up Order. on transit corridors and on provincially owned lands. Start with Danforth Avenue, which runs through the middle question. of my riding. My question to the Premier is, when Will the government commit to building up along transit corridors and building in our own backyards on provincially owned lands? And the Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, you know something? I have a great respect for Triple M over there, but sometimes the cheese slips off the cracker. In your own riding, Triple M, we created 370 long term. Stop the clock. I'm going to caution the Premier on his language, and I'm going to allow him to continue. Mr. Speaker, 370 homes in her riding alone. We're building, we are building 30,000 long-term care homes. Your party in 15 years created 611. 30,000 versus 611. A big difference. But they voted against Order. creating more long-term care homes. They voted against hospitals, voted against the roads to get to the hospitals, voted against the highways to get to the hospitals. They would be against a permit to build a doghouse they'd vote against it. That's what they're about. Response? We get the job done, they sit back, and all they do is complain, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. The next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Energy. My colleague, the member for Lanark-Frontenac-Kingston, has put forward a strong motion that calls on the federal government 
to take immediate steps to eliminate the carbon tax on fuels and inputs for home heating. For many individuals and families, especially in Northern Ontario, the use of fuels to heat their homes is a necessity, not a luxury. Unfortunately, for many people in rural, remote and northern Ontario cities, they are extremely limited in the options they have when it comes to heating their homes. It is not right and it is unfair that they are being punished by this regressive carbon tax simply because of the fuel that they need to survive. Speaker, through you, can the minister please speak to what impact eliminating the carbon tax will have on the energy bills of so many Ontarians, especially in rural, remote and northern communities? Thank you. Energy. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Carleton for a great question. She's absolutely right once again, Mr. Speaker. Heating fuels like natural gas and propane are often the only options for people in rural and remote parts of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, including our First Nations. Over 70 per cent of Ontarians heat their homes with natural gas and propane, Mr. Speaker. Just this year alone, the federal carbon tax, as we've already established, is adding hundreds of dollars to those customers' bills, Mr. Speaker, making life more affordable. It's about $25 a month per family. These families and households are still facing the same challenges as the 2.5% of people who use home heating fuel. They're the only ones that are being exempted from the carbon tax by Canada's federal government, Mr. Speaker. It doesn't make any sense. Why are we not exempting all of those other people that are heating with natural gas and propane from the carbon tax as well, Mr. Speaker? I want to thank the member from Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston for a great motion, and hopefully the Liberal caucus here will stop turning themselves in knots and companies. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his response. The carbon tax is driving up the cost of utilities as it is driving up the cost on everything. I myself live in a rural part in the riding of Carleton, and I'm on propane, and the bills have gone up exponentially. Life is simply more unaffordable today because of the imposition of the federal carbon tax. Sadly, it is even forcing individuals and families to once again have to choose between heating and eating. This is especially concerning as we are approaching winter. Unfortunately, not everyone in this legislature shares the same view about the negative impacts that the carbon tax has had on so many Ontarians and our electricity system. As we saw last week, the opposition Liberals voted against our motion to remove the carbon tax on groceries. Speaker, through you, can the minister please share the concerns of so many Ontarians regarding why anyone would ever support this regressive carbon tax? Thank you. Minister of Energy. It's actually shameful that the members of the Liberal caucus here, all nine of them, would actually sit in here in the legislature and support a carbon tax every step of the way. Mr. Speaker, we've seen the movie before. That's why this party has been reduced to nine seats in the legislature. They wait until the very last minute when people can't afford to heat or eat in their communities, and then they try and do something about it, Mr. Speaker. But this party continues to support the federal government in this carbon tax, one that is going to triple over the next number of years, Mr. Speaker, driving more people into energy poverty. I can't believe the member from Ottawa South is chirping over there. He sat there in a seat when the provincial Liberals were driving up the cost of everything in our province, Mr. Speaker. The Premier's already said it this morning. The carbon tax is wrong. Response. It's not fair to the people of Ontario. We need the opposition parties in this legislature to join us and encourage the feds to scrap the order. The next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you. My question is to the Premier. It's become quite clear to the public that this government is far from meeting their promised housing targets of 1.5 million homes. But now we learn that they have quietly included long-term care beds in the total housing built numbers. I'm not sure if the minister's old documents got mixed up with his new portfolio, but he should be clear that Ontario has both a housing crisis and a long-term care crisis. We're there, we're not fixing either by just padding the numbers. Could the Premier tell us the real numbers today and let Ontarians know how far off they are from meeting their housing goals? The uh, Associate Minister. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Speaker. The member asked for some numbers. Let's give him some numbers, shall we? Shall Fifteen we? years when they propped up the Liberals, they built 611 beds. 
for seniors in this province. That's over 15 years. This government, since 2018, has built or shovels in the ground 18,000. Now, Speaker, the member questions counting those spaces in long-term care homes as homes. Well, I dare the member to go to Pleasant Manor in Niagara Falls, where we just announced hundreds of new beds, and tell the amazing seniors who live there that they are not living in homes, because our government disagrees, Speaker. They are absolutely homes, and we are building 58,000 of them under this Ms. Premier's Ms. leadership, Speaker. We are not going to take lessons from the NDP. We're going to make sure the seniors in this province have the respect and dignity they do. Order. Supplementary question, the member for Niagara Falls. Mr. Speaker, I want to be clear. If you invest in home care, we wouldn't have the number of seniors that are going to live in long-term care, and that's where they want to live. That's Order. the reality. Their home is home with their families. And you don't need to take lessons from me. I'll teach you. As we witness de declining housing starts in the province of Ontario, Order. the people of our province are left in dire need. Your solution, just add the numbers together and hope nobody notices. But it's not accurate, and it means we're far off from tackling our housing crisis. Can the Premier come clean with Ontarians? After being forced to reverse all of their housing policies for the past year, and we know why that happened, is creative math and the only solution he has left Question. on the housing crisis. Thank you very much. Minister of Long-Term Care. Speaker, just when you think the NDP can't blow you away any further, we get this question this morning from the member from Niagara Falls. What is he saying? Is, is he no saying idea. that homes that seniors live in, our most vulnerable seniors, are not homes? I dare the member to walk into Niagara because here are the new homes we are building. Extend to Care St. Catharines, Foyer Welland, Welland Extend to Care Unit, Niagara Health, System, uh, Southridge Niagara, Royal Order. Rose Place, West Hills, uh, Pleasant Manor, Garden City Order. Manor, Lynn Haven Long Term Care, Fairview. Speaker, walk with me into those homes and tell those hardworking seniors Order. who built this country, who built this community, who gave us our lives as we know it, that they're not living in Opposition a home. Speaker, to we're going to continue to make sure we take care of our seniors. They took care of us. We're going to take care of them. Response. We're not taking any lessons from the member office. I'm sure we all had a nice weekend and we come back to the house with a great deal of enthusiasm and it's wonderful to see it, especially this close to Halloween. However, I can't hear what's being said in the house. I would ask the house to come to order or I will start calling members out by name and graduate from there if necessary. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Thornhill. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Energy. Unlike the opposition Liberals and the NDP, our government has always known that the carbon tax is driving up energy prices across this province. That's why our Premier and our government took our fight against this useless and regressive tax all the way to the Supreme Court. And as we head into the winter, I'm glad to see that the federal government is starting to understand the harmful effects of the carbon tax. But they did not go far enough. Speaker, can the minister please explain why the federal government would only pause the carbon tax on home heating oil, which is more emitting and used by only 2.5 per cent of Ontarians, instead of natural gas, which is less emitting and used by, let's say, 70 per cent? Hmm. Minister of Energy. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the member's question is a pretty difficult one to answer, Mr. Speaker, because the federal government's approach to scrapping the carbon tax doesn't make much sense at all, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the federal Liberals have decided to pause the carbon tax on one type of home heating fuel, but continue to increase the cost for those who use 
less emitting types of home heating fuel like natural gas and propane. Most of the people here in Ontario, as I've already said, more than 70 percent of the people in Ontario are using those lower emissions fuels, Mr. Speaker. Ontario families just shouldn't be punished because of a decision made by the Prime Minister and his team in uh, Ottawa. The, the feds need to expand this pause for all for, for people Hamilton Mountain across Cumbria. Ontario there, the Government of Canada, Mr. Speaker, and they should be putting a pause on this for all residents across Canada, not just in Atlantic Canada, Mr. Speaker. It's time that the opposition parties stand with us and oppose this federal carbon tax once and for all. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for the response. I appreciate the frank answer. I absolutely agree that the federal government must move quickly to expand this pause to all forms of heating in Ontario, of home heating in Ontario, or get rid of the tax completely. Yes. As we head, yeah. As we head into the winter, home heating costs are top of mind for our families in my community, and they're looking for us to put in place policies that are going to reduce costs, not increase them. Can Speaker, can the minister please explain what our government is going to do and keep doing to keep costs down for families across Ontario? Minister of Energy. Matter of fact, uh, Mr. Speaker, I can. Our government is continuing to invest in programs to keep energy costs down for families. Just two weeks ago, I announced an increase to the Ontario electricity rebate, the OER, increasing that to 19.3 percent to ensure that electricity bills for the people of Ontario remain stable and that they remain predictable. And that goes not just for families, but for small businesses and farms as well, Mr. Speaker. The average customer in Ontario is going to see a rebate of $26 a month. But when when it comes to home heating and natural gas, we need the federal government to come to the table, Mr. Speaker, and join us in trying to make life more affordable for the people of Ontario, not just the people of Atlantic Canada, Mr. Speaker, but for people across Canada, Mr. Speaker. As the Premier said this Response. morning, this tax is wrong. It's hurting people in Ontario. It's hurting people right across Canada. It's not fair to the people, and we should scrap this tax. Thank you. Next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Last week on October 23rd, four people, including three children aged 6, 7, and 12, were fatally shot in Sault Ste. Marie. Police are calling the shootings a result of intimate partner violence. The Premier called the news gut wrenching. But his words ring hollow when he refuses to even act on the first recommendation of the Renfrew inquest, which is to declare intimate partner violence an epidemic. I'll give the Premier one more chance today to stand with survivors. Will the Premier support cities and their public health officials by finally declaring intimate partner violence an epidemic? And to apply, the Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this is a serious matter, and our thoughts are with the victims and their families. But symbolism does not affect change. And that's why we know that this is, all, this is an all-systems partner that will be engaged, and we're taking a broad lens. I said last week, Mr. Speaker, there were concrete things that we're doing. Mr. Speaker, we're enhancing the training at the Ontario Police College for the newest cadets, and I've seen this for myself. Mr. Speaker, I said that we are uh, giving grants to 45 uh, organizations that will help people in their communities through victim services. And this is part of a $55 million investment that we're doing. And Mr. Speaker, we will also and always Spons. hold the offenders to account. The supplementary question. Speaker, Speaker, calling the Renfrew report symbolism is rather insulting and very deeply hurtful. Speaker, we need to talk about how intimate partner violence harms and kills children as they live with their mothers. On average, a woman is killed by an intimate partner in every six days in Canada. And as of September 30th, there have been 46 femicides in Ontario alone, and that number has now become higher. The Canadian Domestic Homicide Prevention Initiative has found that at least 30 children are killed annually in Canada by one of their parents. Speaker, the clock is running out. 
When will the Premier finally take action to protect children and their mothers by declaring intimate partner violence an epidemic? Members will please take their seats. Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker, this is a serious matter. But that's why we're acting. That's exactly why we're acting. That's exactly why, as part of the Ontario Gun Gangs and Violent Reduction Strategy, our government invested more than $4 million in 45 projects to help the victims. Mr. Speaker, that's why, at the Ontario Police College, we are ensuring that every cadet receives training on intimate partner violence. And, Mr. Speaker, that's why we are investing $55 million across the system. But, Mr. Order. Speaker, as I said before, as I said before, we're engaging all partners to act, and we're looking at this at a broad lens. And most importantly, we will hold the offenders to account for their actions, which is absolutely Order. inappropriate. Order. The next question, the member for Mississauga, Aaron Mills. Thank you, Mr. S Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Energy. As the Premier said last month, the delivery of every product we have in the province is being affected by the worst tax this country has ever seen. It is useless tax, and that's a carbon tax. I absolutely agree with the Premier on this because while our government has remained laser focused, on lowering the cost, the carbon tax is working against us. That's right. Speaker, we have heard a lot about the high cost of energy bills today, but can the minister also please explain how the carbon tax is driving up the cost of everything else? Sir, of energy. Thanks to the member opposite, uh, as has been well documented, the carbon tax is driving up the cost of everything, Mr. Speaker. It's driving up the cost of fuel. It's driving up the cost of produce and groceries. It's driving up the cost of everything. You know, as the Minister of Agriculture has been saying for a couple of years now, Mr. Speaker, it's driving up the cost of fruits and vegetables in our grocery stores. And it's pretty simple, Speaker, because, you know, the carbon tax is applied to the fertilizer that the farmers are using. The carbon tax is applied to the fuel that runs their tractors, Mr. Speaker. The carbon tax drives up the cost of the distributors' trucks to get it to the grocery store, Speaker. And then the carbon tax also drives up the cost of energy at those Order. grocery stores, Mr. Speaker. And it drives up the cost of the individual's Everything. fuel to go to the Everything. grocery store to get the fruits and vegetables. This is a terrible tax, Mr. Speaker. We've been fighting this tax here on this side of the House since 2018, Mr. Speaker. We need the federal government, we need opposition to come together to make life more affordable. The supplementary question. Speaker, thank you to the minister for his response. This is exactly why our government spoke up about that carbon tax and why we fought it tooth and nail. Because we knew it would increase costs of everything in our communities. Speaker, the most concerning part about the carbon tax is that it will only get worse. The federal government and opposition parties want to nearly triple the tax by 20, 20, 20, 2030. Speaker, can the minister please explain why Ontario families cannot afford the tax increase the Liberals and the NEP are planning and pushing for? Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, thanks to the member for the question. What our government recognized right from the start was that this tax was going to have a harmful impact on our economy and for the people of Ontario, and that's why we fought it. You know, it's not a choice, it's a necessity in this province. A family shouldn't have to decide. I almost feel like back in my opposition days, Mr. Speaker, when we were criticizing the provincial Liberal government for making people choose between heating and eating. That's what that same crop of Liberals have now done on Parliament Hill, Mr. Speaker. They haven't just done it for Ontario, though. They've done it for all of Canada. A construction worker has no choice on how they're going to get to work. They're driving their truck and they're paying the carbon tax on that. The mom who's taking her son or daughter to school has to pay the carbon tax on their fuel, Mr. Speaker. While we've been busy on this side of the House making Response. life more affordable for the people of Ontario when it comes to electricity prices and fighting the carbon tax every step of the way, getting rid of tolls, getting rid of license plate stickers. Order. 
next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Data recently released by the Landlord and Tenant Board shows that applications for personal use evictions are up 77 per cent in Toronto. Disturbingly, the data also shows that the Landlord and Tenant Board has only issued 11 fines for bad faith evictions in nearly four years. Tenant lawyers are saying that number is staggeringly low and reflects a failure by the province to protect tenants. Tenants are losing their homes in record numbers. What is this government going to do to end bad faith evictions and keep tenants housed? To reply, the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll tell you what the government's going to do. The government's going to continue to do what it's been doing, which is put in resources, change processes, double the number of people who are adjudicators, Mr. Speaker. We have changed absolutely every part of it. We are chunking away at the backlog because we paused evictions during COVID. Now, Mr. Speaker, what is the common theme among all of these things? Investing in people, processes, and technology? The opposition voted against every single one, every single time, Mr. Speaker. A supplementary question. Speaker, the government introduced the Helping Home Buyers Protecting Tenants Act, but it did not protect tenants from bad faith evictions. In fact, doubling fines we know does not have the impact that's needed, especially if they're not being utilized. Speaker, the government has yet to proclaim the bill despite it receiving royal assent in June. Again, the government is failing to protect tenants and must do more. What tangible actions will you take to put an end to bad faith evictions and keep tenants housed? The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, I'm, and thank you for the question. I, I'm a little confused. The, the member opposite is upset that we're not proclaiming a bill that she thinks is faulty legislation. So I'm not sure you know, how the logic works. But I, it, I, I think it's liberal math, Mr. Speaker. When we double the number of adjudicators, that can allow us to double the amount of hearings, Mr. Speaker. When we change the rules to take out red tape, that allows us to get through more hearings, Mr. Speaker. When we invest tens of millions of dollars in staffing and technology, Mr. Speaker, it allows us to bring the Landlord-Tenant Board up to a system that Ontarians expect and deserve. Mr. Speaker, the NDP supported these Liberals in letting the system go fallow, Mr. Speaker. Order. We are going to make sure the people of Ontario, Order. both landlords and tenants, get the hearings that they need and deserve, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah, yeah. The next question, the member for Brantford Grant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. We've heard today about our government's work to make life in this province more affordable. One of the programs that we put in place to help Ontarians is the Clean Home Heating Initiative. This program will help make home heating not just more affordable, but also cleaner by providing grants to support the purchase and installation of hybrid heat pumps. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Energy, has the federal government reached out at any point to inquire about topping up this program with federal dollars to make home heating more affordable for Ontarians? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Thanks, Speaker. As I've mentioned several times uh, today, our government has worked hard to make life more affordable for the people of Ontario. And just one of the initiatives that we launched is the program that the member mentioned, the Clean Home Heating Initiative, or the CHHI, which will provide funding for hybrid heat pumps for up to 1,500 people across the province. Switching to hybrid could save up to $300 a year for families, but the uh, answer to the member's question is no, the federal government didn't reach out to talk to us about how we could expand this program across Ontario. It's unfortunate because it is working for the people of Ontario. They chose to only expand this type of program for the people of Atlantic Canada. And I'm not exactly sure why they would do that, Mr. Speaker, because it's not just Atlantic Canadians that are hurting with the impacts Response. of the carbon tax in that jurisdiction. It's people right across this country, and that includes all of the people in Ontario who are suffering with an affordability crisis because of the federal government's carbon tax. We need to act. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that answer. But I have to tell you, it's extremely disappointing to hear that response. We've heard loud and clear today that the federal government must take broader action to help all Ontarians who are experiencing the impacts of rising costs. 
My constituents remain concerned that the federal government is not exploring opportunities that will lead to real solutions. In fact, the federal government has doubled down on their failed program by keeping the carbon tax on all other forms of home heating. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on what benefits could be provided to Ontario families as part of the hybrid home heating system? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Hybrid heat pumps allow households to leverage Ontario's world-class clean electricity system uh, to both heat and cool their homes with a hybrid heat pump, which switches between electricity and natural gas. It's just one of the many programs that we put in place, Speaker, to make life more affordable. Um, you know, we talked about the Ontario electricity rebate, Speaker. We talked about the 10 cent a liter savings that the people of Ontario are experiencing here in this province while the feds continue to make the carbon tax go up and up and up every year, Mr. Speaker. They want to triple the tax, and it's so disheartening when we're doing everything we can in Ontario to make life more affordable for the people of Ontario when the federal government and members of the Liberal opposition and members of the NDP opposition and that green guy in this legislature want to drive Response. up the cost of everything, Mr. Speaker. We're taking tolls off toll routes in Ontario. We're giving people back their fees on license plate stickers, Mr. Speaker. We're doing all of this, and at the same time, the Thank you. The next question, the member for Temiskaming Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Agriculture. Um, as I've made the House aware many times, we have a former dairy lagoon in the district of Temiskaming, which is used now used to house raw human sewage. Now that sewage is being spread on farmland, farmers need a nutrient management plan for their agricultural waste, but we've been unable to find the non-agricultural source material plan that agricultural needs when raw human sewage is spread on a farm. Is, it, is, is that plan needed when raw human sewage is spread on agricultural land which crops are sold that could be very well used in human food? Thank you. Yeah. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, I I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the environmental farm plan that we have in Ontario because really and truly we lead North America with the environmental farm plan that dates back to the 1990s. We have demonstrated time and again that we are the best stewards when it comes to the efforts that have been put forward by farmers. You know, back in the 90s, and I'm sure the member opposite himself ran to AMAFRA offices to take part in the winter courses that improved the, the, the knowledge and the ultimate uh, application on farms when it comes to environmental farm plans. And with that said, I can tell you with absolute certainty that OMAFRA is working with the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change and in a proactive way to address this matter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this.